Welcome back to everybody. In this lecture, we will focus our attention on the problem of robots interacting with the environment. More in particular, we will focus on the problem of controlling uh, the contact, so the exchanges forces between the robot and the environment, and the motion that the robot may have in contact with the environment. So we will not uh, deal too much with modeling the geometry of the environment uh, insofar that the modeling is needed in order to perform this task. We will uh, see that the modeling part and the control part in this type of interaction tasks are strictly related one to each other. So while so far we have considered uh, considered only uh, robot in free motion, now we will see what are the characteristics of interacting physically with the environment. In particular, there are uh, two, way, two ways in which the robot, mainly through its end effector, its tooling, uh, may have a physical interaction with the environment. First, modifying the state of the environment. For instance, when the robot is doing a pick-and-place operation in which it moves an object from one part of its workspace to another part, from one place to another. Uh, there are a number of tasks in which uh, the force exchange is of uh, primary relevance. For instance, when we are assembling parts and we have to push one side of one object to another side of the object, uh, make them uh, surfaces sliding one with respect to the other. Or when we are doing mechanical operation involving, for instance, a surface finishing cast of metallic object. The main difference between controlling the robot in free motion and controlling the interaction may be also assessed by the number and type of sensor that are being used. For instance, in this uh, picture, we see a robot carrying a camera and doing an inspection task. For doing this task, uh, the end effector and the camera in particular should follow a prescribed path with a given time block. In order to execute this type of free motion task, we typically use position measurement at the joints through encoders, uh, if needed also velocity information at the joint, typically obtained by numerical differentiation and less and less uh, common using tachometers. But we may also use other type of sensor, for instance vision uh, by the camera, mounted eye in hand, or uh, the end effector motion is driven by the uh, scene uh, view by a camera which is placed fixed in the environment and so on. But essentially the matter is a matter of controlling in time the position of the end effector or equivalently the position of the joints once we transform through the inverse kinematic and inverse differential kinematic the uh, desired motion in the Cartesian space. Whereas uh, typical cases of uh, robot environment interaction it's executing what is called usually compliant motion. Compliant motion in the sense that uh, the end effect of the robot, which is the main point where the interaction occurs, uh, should comply with the stiffness or, uh, say, the geometry and the stiffness of the environment. A typical task, uh, assembly task, is what is called peg in hole. So a peg should enter a hole with very limited clearance. For doing those tasks, uh, we certainly use and need the previous sensor for our free motion control, in particular encoders and sometimes also camera in the Cartesian space, but it is very convenient to have also a direct measure of the force exchange at the level of the end effector. And typically we do so 
by uh, equipping the robot with a 60 uh, four-store sensor mounted at the robot wrist. So the closest possible to the point of contact, although uh, most of the time we cannot mount uh, a, measuring, a force measuring device exactly at the contact because otherwise we would either destroy the sensor or not having the tool uh, in the right uh, form and shape to execute uh, its uh, mechanical task. So when talking about robot compliance, uh, usually we distinguish between two types of uh, compliance, namely passive and active. Passive compliance is realized uh, by adding some uh, devices uh, on the robot and the factor which comply with the forces that are being exchanged when the uh, end effector of the robot enters in contact with some workpiece. We usually talk about TCP, so tool center point, by characterizing uh, the position of in the end effector frame, which where the main exchange of, for, of, uh, of contact forces and moments should uh, re should be realized. So, for this type of uh, passive compliance, so it's a, uh, a way in which the robot continues to execute essentially a, a geometric plan with the trajectory, so with time in motion, uh, without caring of the presence of this context. The context and the forces that arise at the contact are handled passively by these mechatronic devices. And we will see in a moment uh, the main uh, device that is being used in, uh, for giving passive compliance to a robot is the, the use of a device which is called RCC, so Remote Center of Compliance. And we will see how this works and what are the pros and cons of such a solution. On the other hand, one can uh, incorporate into the robot system some active compliance, which is typically a software-based uh, characteristic. So it's a way in which you design control law uh, so as the robot can react in a specific and desired way to the generalized forces or forces and torques that are being applied from the end effector, from the environment on the end effector, and in particular at the tool center point. And these forces are typically measured by a force store sensor. Now, in this context, uh, we will see that there are different ways in which this reaction, so the control law, can be designed. And by and large, we characterize three categories of control laws. Uh, admittance control laws, stiffness or compliance control, and impedance control. Uh, in the first type, uh, the forces, the contact forces that arise uh, when the end effector uh, is in contact with, uh, with the environment are measured and translated into velocity commands. And this can be done at different levels, at the Cartesian level or at the joint level. The velocity commands are being are given then as reference to some low-level control loops which are designed or embedded at the joint level of the robot. Stiffness or compliance control, these two terms are used uh, uh, equivalently, in fact, one is the inverse of the other. If you have a stiff environment, it has low compliance. If you have a, a low stiffness environment, it has large compliance. In this case, uh, the displacement of the tool center point with respect to some reference position will generate some force commands. Again, force commands are nominally generated at the end effector, but then they should be realized by proper command torque command at the joint level. The third class of this type of uh, active compliance are impedance control, is impedance control. In this case, uh, there is no uh, 
one-way direction between contact forces and displacement or velocities. But in fact, we try to match uh, a desired interaction model uh, which relates displacement of the contact point with respect to some uh, reference position with contact forces that are being applied uh, in the interaction. And we will see in more detail how these uh, methods can be designed and their properties. There's a, another way of handling interaction, which is more geometrically oriented, uh, in which um, we don't impose a compliance necessarily in some direction, but we separately control the interaction forces in direction where uh, contact occurs, while controlling purely motion in the free direction of the Cartesian space where the end effector can freely move. And this is what uh, underlies uh, hybrid control methods. Hybrid in the sense that we are simultaneously controlling in different direction uh, force or motion. And we will see more in detail this later. So with this picture, uh, general picture in, in mind, we start looking at passive compliance, and in particular, how an RCC uh, device works. So, uh, from a viewpoint, uh, from an external point of view, these RCC uh, devices uh, look like uh, four-store sensors. So they have a cylindrical uh, um, shape. Uh, one top plate is being uh, fixed to the uh, final flange of the end effector, uh, the bottom plate will uh, carry some tool. So it is mounted at, at the level of the end effector of a robot. It comes in different size and of course each size has some uh, range of uh, value under which uh, the device reacts with displacement to applied forces. And essentially uh, the two plates are uh, connected one to the other with flexible elements. So kind of springs or springs-like uh, components which allow one plate to move relatively to the other. In particular, the bottom plate, which holds the tool, relative to the top plate, which is attached to the end effector of the robot. So the robot will continue moving uh, as planned so it will move the top plate in any direction. Uh, if a contact occurs, it occurs uh, with a tool which is mounted, uh, which is attached to the bottom plate of the RCC. So uh, there could be a compression, there could be a tension, there could be a torsion around the uh, approach axis. There could be some lateral uh, angular displacement, which is also called cocking in the literature. So let's uh, visualize with uh, a couple of uh, sequential figures what happens when a robot is trying to execute an assembly task while, mount while mounting a, a remote center of compliance device. So there is one point associated to the device, uh, which is exactly the RCC point, uh, which behaves in a very special way because of the mechanical construction of the device. So imagine on top of the figure uh, a robot holding uh, the RCC and below the RCC there's a gripper and the gripper is firmly holding a peg. And this peg should be inserted in a hole. The hole typically has some chamfers, so this diagonal uh, invitation um, sides in order to uh, ease the insertion even in the presence of a small lateral and angular clearance. So the robot is pushing down uh, the end effector, uh, its end effector, so including the RCC, the gripper, and the peg that should be inserted in the hole. So the assembly force on top represents this motion of the robot, which is planned independently of the presence of a contact or not. Now, if everything was perfectly known, so the geometry of the environment, so the position and orientation of the hole 
is known to the robot and the robot has a um, very accurate position, this task could be performed in a pure geometric way. However, due to a number of uh, uncertainty and disturbances, there could be a misalignment, both uh, lateral of the peg with respect to the center of the hole and also angular, so a cocking misalignment between the surface on which the hole is placed and the vertical direction or the uh, vertical direction of ascending. So a cocking misalignment. So while uh, approaching first in free motion and then in the first contact, there will be uh, a contact typically uh, on one of the chamfer laterally to the hole. So um, if there's a large error, in fact, we are uh, touching the surface completely out of the hole and then the presence of uh, RCC point would not help. So we are talking now uh, of small misalignment error during assembly task. So when this happens and the contact, a single point contact occurs at the remote center of compliance or very close to it, then uh, the device, in particular the bottom plate, react by a small displacement exactly in the direction of the applied contact force. So the situation is the following. Since the first contact produces a force laterally, then the top plate, uh, the bottom plate, sorry, is displaced in the same lateral direction with respect to the uh, top plate. The robot continues to push exactly in the same way, so continue to lower down the whole uh, set of devices which is mounted on the end effector and, and this will uh, sooner or later will bring the peg in double contact so at this point this double contact uh, produces two contact forces which generates a, a momentum on the peg hole and therefore since the peg hole is rigidly attached to the bottom plate, to the gripper, uh, this moment will generate a rotation around the uh, remote center of compliance point. And as you can see from uh, this sequence, you will see that passively the um, hold peg will accommodate to the actual position or orientation of the hole. Indeed, this whole process will uh, be successful only if we tolerate a uh, small uncertainty on this assembly task. Uh, these RCC devices have the possibility of uh, adjusting offline, so not in real time, uh, their center of compliance. And the actual position of the center of compliance may uh, have a strong influence on the behavior of the, um, of the bottom plate uh, with respect to an assembly task. For instance, if uh, the center of compliance is uh, positioned by tuning the mechanical parameter of the RCC too high or too low, the reaction of the um, point of contact at the point of contact to forces or momentum will be not a pure translation in the direction of the applied force or a pure rotation around the um, contact point. All this will occur at the uh, center of compliance. So only if the center of compliance is a position close to the point where the contact will actually occur, so at the lower part of the peg being inserted in the hole, then a correct decoupling, mechanical decoupling of motion will occur. So the bottom plate of the RCC will react with a linear motion in the direction of the applied contact force or with an angular motion around the axis of application of a, a momentum uh, due to the contact, typically for double contact uh, situation. And uh, in this uh, graph, 
You can see uh, from uh, a study of assembly forces the typical evolution of the force while uh, getting in contact. So when uh, you see below the peg hole entering in single contact point on the chamfer side of the hole and while doing this because of the assembly force being applied from above uh, the contact force will typically linearly increase over uh, the depth insertion. So here this graph is not over time but is with respect to how deep we are getting inside the hole. So the first contact point of contact is the zero level of insertion and from there on we we'll continue to push so we uh, apply more and more lateral force uh, until this forces breaks the friction at the contact and the peg starts sliding on the chamfer. So when this happens the contact forces is being reduced and is kept to a constant value while inserting. At a certain point uh, after this sliding phase there will be a two-point contact force, a generation of momentum, so the contact force will be affected in a uh, estimated circular way in, in this case, but this depends of course on the geometry and, and, and other uh, aspects. Uh, there's a function also of the angle of the chamfer, of the coefficient friction uh, in the contact, um, the hole diameter plays another, um, another role, in particular the difference between the uh, part diameter and the hole diameter, which is in fact the clearance in the pegging hole task. Okay, so uh, this device for many industrial applications where uh, tolerance are present but the accuracy is and the knowledge of the environment geometry is um, relatively high, so it's what we call a structured environment. Uh, this RCC is a successful uh, choice. Indeed, um, when conditions change, when the type of task change and interaction should still um, allow to execute the task correctly, so controlling forces and having displacement in the right direction, then the active strategy of compliance, of course, uh, lends itself to a more flexible solution. In this case, uh, we have typically the use of a four-star sensor, like in this uh, slide. Uh, so the robot is equipped with a four-star sensor. Again, the top plate of the force sensor is uh, attached to the flange of the final flange of the robot. The bottom plate may hold a tool, like in the left picture, where a polishing tool is being used in order to uh, do contour following uh, on, a, on a given workpiece and applying uh, uh, enough forces normal to the surface so that the surface is being polished. You can see for instance uh, in the two um, photos on the right hand side uh, the polishing of a wash stand or uh, of a metallic cabinet. Indeed in this case uh, the uh, motion and the force will depend uh, on the geometry of the environment, so some information should be known about the geometry of the workpiece, and the exchanged forces uh, are being recorded in a frame which is close to the contact frame, uh, in fact is where the force star sensor is being uh, mounted. So uh, between the force sensor and the uh, um, the tool center point, so the, the, the tip of the polishing tool, uh, there, is no degree, there are no degrees of freedom. So this can be considered as a rigid body and we know already how to transform uh, forces and moments uh, evaluated uh, around a frame which is attached to the sensor in forces at moment in a different point uh, which is related by a, a rotary translation and this is true for a rigid body. So this is why the force sensor is being placed at the end of the kinematic chain. Uh, 
and so in direct contact uh, to uh, an object which is uh, a rigid tool with the environment uh, through which the tip of the tool is in contact. So this is uh, one possibility, so contour following for some uh, 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 polishing uh, operation. There's another um, interesting situation, again in assembly, where in assembly where you have parts which should match one to each other. For instance, when you're mounting jeered parts where the teeth uh, should be uh, engaged with teeth from another uh, mechanical part. So uh, again, this insertion requires the uh, detection of contact forces which represent the fact that you are not oriented correctly in, uh, in any direction um, with the holding parts with respect to the parts that is placed in the environment and the two should be one inserted in the other. So you can process force information, so you can reason about sensory information in order to adjust uh, little by little, I would say, the end effect of position so to complete the insertion. So in this case, this is a form of active compliance and there are ways in which you can process forces and generate displacement or process displacement and generate forces according to a, an admittance or a compliance uh, active control scheme. So these are two uh, representative cases, but in fact there are many tasks in which environment interaction is of relevant. Uh, at the industrial level there are a number of um, mechanical machining uh, operation like surface finishing or polishing we have seen before and assembly but also debarring which uh, involves the uh, elimination of extra material which is the result of some technological process made on the workpiece uh, and which is, uh, should be removed from the surface or from a contour of an object. Uh, for removing this uh, extra material, we typically need to uh, follow a nominal geometric path which is on the surface of the object while applying forces. Because if we don't apply forces, we are not able to remove this extra material which is typically relatively hard. So this is an industrial application. There are other uh, semi-industrial applications, for instance, in the, in the um, radioactive environment which are involved in nuclear plants, uh, telemanipulation. In telemanipulation, we have a master driven by a human, and we have a, a robot slave which is reproducing uh, through scaling and uh, geometric transformation the motion of the master and there is uh, some remote contact and this remote contact is fed back as a force sensation on the master and on the human that is moving the master. So this is what is called telemanipulation, so there is a remote contact and uh, this remote contact, the force in the remote contact is being transferred to the human operator and this force feedback allows uh, to complete telemanipulation tasks in a much more performant way. Uh, you can use also uh, the contact, so the, inter the interaction with the environment, for instance, for exploring and identifying the shape on a, of an object. Of course, you can uh, combine uh, vision information with force information, and you can uh, start from an unknown object and do a counter following and then a 2D or even a 3D geometric um, uh, shape of the object. So you're using actively the contact forces in order to understand the form, the shape of an object. We have seen such type of uh, operation in one of the introductory videos of this course. There are other more research-oriented situations in which environment interaction is of concern. For instance, if you have a, a dexterous robot hands, so uh, a device with several fingers, I would say from three to five, uh, of the size of a human hand, and 
and more and more uh, we are able to uh, design compact um, hands which have the similar manipulability characteristic as the human hand. In these cases we have contact in several points and we would like to adapt the uh, shape of the finger to the contact forces. Uh, we may have uh, sensory uh, devices distributed along um, along the finger uh, along the fingers, not only at the fingertips, but also on each limb of a single finger. And so, these multiple contacts uh, will drive uh, the way in which the hands the hands perform. Let's say either a power grasp, so a, a grasp that resists to external forces or uh, fine in-hand manipulation which uh, requires dexterity and in this case uh, the problem is much more hard. So, but in any case uh, this is a type of uh, task where uh, motion and, and force interaction with the held object is very important. Uh, and similarly you may think of cooperation of multi-manipulator systems so let's say two or three manipulators that cooperate at the same time holding a very ob heavy object, for instance, for serving a medically controlled machine uh, uh, in which a single robot uh, would, the, the payload would exceed, uh, the weight of the payload would exceed the capability of a single robot. In this case, the cooperation, in the cooperation, uh, small relative position error in executing trajectory will induce very large internal forces. So in this case we should uh, simultaneously control motion but also the exchange of forces between one and another uh, manipulator. And these are typically so-called internal forces which may damage in fact the held object if not uh, kept limited. And finally uh, the environment itself may be a human, one or more humans that are very dynamic environment in the sense that uh, they apply forces, they move mostly in an unpredictable way or not known a priori. There could be uh, cameras that overlook the motion of the human and there are phases in which a physical interaction should occur. For instance, the human is passing object to the robot and vice versa, or together they're applying forces to a third object. So uh, all this should be handled and should be handled under an extra condition, which is full safety, because the human is now in contact or in very close proximity to the uh, robot. So lightweight robots are being used in such situation and this is a new trend in the industry 4.0 and beyond uh, of um, advanced automation. So even in this case, the exchanges of forces together with the coordinated motion are very important. So let's uh, look at a little bit closer to uh, some mechanical machine operation. Uh, here in this uh, picture you can see that there are multiple ways in which you can have a contact between a tool and a workpiece. And the workpiece may be stationary or may travel in different direction, uh, while the tool may rotate or slide uh, in different direction. And the relative uh, uh, tool workpiece motion uh, is realized in different ways. And each is more appropriate to certain mechanical machining operation. Uh, for instance, here uh, you can see a robot with a, a big tool mounted. This is an ABB uh, motor holding a, a tool which is uh, intended for uh, abrasive finishing. So for removing the um, rugosity from a surface by uh, applying force. And here you can see two ways of uh, holding the tool, the tool that may rotate uh, in the first case around the horizontal axis, but this rotation internally through the tool will let the tool uh, center point, so the uh, point in contact, uh, go in a 
uh, alternative um, up and down direction while in contact with the, with the workpiece on which uh, it's a force uh, is being applied and this force will uh, execute the polishing task, in fact. Uh, there are other situations in which um, the tool holder um, apply directly uh, rotational uh, speed uh, to the tool while in contact. So the normal force is still the force that achieve the abrasive finishing of surface, but uh, the tool itself is rotating and not translating in contact with the environment or with the workpiece in this case. Uh, there are other ways in which you achieve uh, abrasive finishing, so with the contact. For instance, in this uh, small video, we will see uh, a technological process in which uh, after having uh, forged uh, uh, surfaces, uh, there is a final finishing of the surfaces uh, by a pneumatic machine, which applies what is called hammer pinning. So uh, it's a very high frequency oscillation in contact so that uh, you uh, it's like hammering at a very fast frequency so that the resulting uh, um, effect on the metallic part is that of uh, an abrasive finish. Let's see together the video. So you see that the tool is uh, getting closer. Now uh, it takes a reference and now you see uh, in slow motion or in fast motion uh, the way in which the top of the tool, the, the tip of the tool, I would say, is going up and down on the surface and uh, achieving uh, removal of rugosity so that these surfaces are very smooth. And here you can see that we may need the full degrees of freedom of the end effect of a robot in order to accommodate uh, complex uh, geometries, like in this case where the hammer, the tip of the hammer, needs to follow curved surfaces and uh, also this is a close-up and also in order to avoid collision should also reorient in the proper way. Here you see at the curve and, and so on. So this gives an idea of the type of uh, contact motion that is needed. In this case, the, uh, this device by a company which is called Semantec, mounted on an ABB robot, is uh, uh, following the path while, in fact, uh, applying forces. And the fact that these are oscillatory forces is uh, connected to the technological process itself. Um, there are other ways in which uh, this operation can be done and uh, you may be surprised but you can do surface finishing also without having contact so in which the forces are not uh, of importance for instance in the top video uh, you see uh, a technology based on fluid jet in which uh, a high pressure liquid is being uh, uh, pushed against the surface, so what you see, uh, the line that you see is in fact is a uh, high pressure uh, water uh, or a mix of water and other components uh, by which you're soliciting this surface in the various direction in order to polish them. And you see that some water is coming out of the workpiece and in fact this needs a lot of uh, uh, preparation of the environment in order to avoid to spill over everything. But this is a very successful technology. It has been used, for instance, in a European project that we participated up to uh, two years ago, the Simplexity project of the H2020 program. Another technology which achieves surface uh, finishing without contact is uh, a laser technology. In this case, uh, of course, the laser is mounted on, on the end effector of the robot. Uh, it's a high energy laser, but it's a pulsed laser. So uh, 
In any case, uh, the human should not be close to the system, and this is why uh, this type of uh, robotized uh, uh, surface finishing is realized inside a closed chamber, so uh, in the absence of the human. And you see here the red dot is in fact the uh, pulsed laser that is uh, being applied to the surface of the object being carried and the object then is, can be reoriented so that uh, the processing can be made on different uh, surfaces and in this case it is very clean and precise of course uh, because there's no material uh, or uh, support fluid being used like in the previous case so this is just to mention that there are other ways in which you can do this mechanical machining without the need of having contact. Of course, in this case, you need a high accuracy in position only. And this is uh, the task is being completed. And the, the object is removed from the laser chamber. So, in all these cases that we have considered, uh, so this uh, physical interaction task, we have seen that, in general, there's a desired motion, so things should not be done necessarily in static position only, even in uh, assembly tasks where the speed involved are relatively slow, there is a motion involved in the operation, but together uh, there are data collected uh, and processed in order that some desired force is being also realized at the contact. So we have a, a hybrid situation, both at the planning and at the control level, so we should plan a task in which motion and forces are assigned, and of course, after having planned such task, we need to uh, do control, which execute the hybrid control of both quantities in a suitable way. Now, uh, in particular, there are situations in which uh, we want explicitly control the contact forces, so we assign a value to these forces and torques and we close a loop uh, between the measured quantities and the desired quantities. So this is a conventional force control loop. Uh, there are other situations in which uh, a, an exact value of force at the contact is not uh, strictly necessary. Uh, the only thing we would like to do is to apply some force and to keep this force limited below a value which may damage the parts or the human on the other side. Okay, so this is a, a basic difference also uh, in, in the way we model the uh, interaction and in the way we process the data information in order to realize uh, the proper interaction. We will see that there are situations in which the model itself is compliant and there are situations in which the best model is a very stiff uh, situation, so a purely geometric uh, situation in which the end effector is constrained to live uh, on a surface, and accordingly there are different ways from this modeling of processing uh, the control law. Uh, I present here uh, a bit of history from control approaches in the presence of interaction. These are very old works, but just to uh, show that this problem was uh, felt important uh, right from the beginning of the robotic area. So, uh, between the late 70s and the mid of 80s, the, the foundation of interaction were uh, laid down by a number of researchers, so I'm not reporting uh, years or publication, but just the name because they were quite important in the history of uh, uh, interac robot interaction control. So, um, David Whitney um, in the US started assembly, he was interested in assembly, so in quasi-static operation, and there were, during part insertion, a number of deadlock that could occur while doing pure, for, pure position control. So, he proposed the explicit measurement of forces, either directly or indirectly, for instance measuring the applied current to the motor uh, in, um, 
of the system interacting with the environment and of course when you are in contact and you try to apply a force the current in the motors will increase so by measuring the current you indirectly could measure the force or having a cell uh, a load cell uh, so a single degree of freedom uh, device uh, measuring force in one direction to be included in the assembly operation so he was the first pioneering the explicit control of force in assembly uh, right, away, uh, right after there were a uh, different way of achieving admittance or compliance control. So, uh, Paul and Salisbury and Shimano uh, wrote a number of papers and implemented system in which uh, the contact forces were uh, controlled by controlling position or velocity uh, of the robot and effect. So you have a stiffness control uh, or a damping control uh, in the two cases. Or le uh, letting, so in this case, you relate forces to motion, so you have an admittance control effect. Or uh, you may uh, react uh, um, to displacement, generating forces, by virtual spring and dampers in some selected direction or in all, all direct, um, direction. In this case, uh, from a deformation, you generate a force, so you do what is called compliance control. Uh, later on, Hogan, in a very important uh, two-part paper, introduced the concept of impedance control, namely of uh, design and control law. So we are talking, in all cases, of active compliant strategies, so uh, software-based or control-based strategies, in which when the robot is in contact with the environment, uh, we would like that the behavior matches some reference model uh, in which forces and position dynamically interact, typically like a mass spring damper system. Uh, we can tune the parameter of the model in such a uh, way that we achieve um, a good behavior at the contact, although we are not explicitly controlling, so setting references for forces, nor setting reference for position. In fact, it's a combination that occurs in this interaction. And this combination behaves like a model that we have chosen and uh, whose par which parameters can be set according to some intuitive uh, physical reasoning. In fact, impedance control uh, mimics, we will see a simple example, uh, the behavior of a human hand, a uh, human arm, moving in an, uh, an environment uh, which is partly free space, uh, in some area we may interact with a physical wall, and uh, there is some uncertainty in this, so the best behavior that we apply is that of an, an impedance controller, and this has been replicated also on a uh, uh, robotic arm. Finally, uh, led by Mason and then by researchers like Rayburn, Rayburn and Craig, and finally by Usama Khatib, uh, there has been uh, the concept of uh, hybrid force motion control. So in this case, uh, we talk about, we start talking about uh, so-called task space, which is a kind of a variation of the Cartesian space. So there's a new frame being defined and associated to each uh, hybrid uh, force motion control task. This task frame moves together with the execution of the task. And in this particular task frame, its position and orientation is such that in each of the individual direction, we can either uh, control force or control motion. By motion, I intend position, velocity, whatever. And this type of decomposition of the Cartesian direction, in particular, in the direction of the task frame associated to the task, uh, is followed by a purely kinematic controller, so eventually we are specifying the velocity command at the joint level, 
or by involving the full dynamic model of the robot, and this is the latest results by Katib, which uh, set a standard in, in this type of context. There has been many variations uh, in the hybrid force motion control um, uh, literature, in particular including uh, uh, deformation of the joints of the robot or uh, a model of the environment which includes farther dynamic elements and so on and so on. But basically the layout was set by the work of Katib. In fact, this work is the most appropriate for uh, dealing with uh, dynamic interaction uh, when the motion needs to be accurate and relatively fast and the forces need to be controlled as well. So, uh, again, um, to summarize, the um, hybrid task in general require both uh, reproduction of uh, desired trajectory, low speed or high speed, we don't care in general, which are defined on the surface of object. So, uh, trajectory tracking, but in the presence of a contact. And as well, we would like to be able to control the uh, exchange of forces and torques applied at the contact. And this independently of the fact that the environment has a, a soft or uh, rigid characteristic, so low or high stiffness. Uh, you may, you should think of, of the following aspect. Imagine that you have a, a, your hand moving in contact with the table. Now, uh, if you observe this motion, uh, you don't realize if you're moving, I mean, not immediately, if you're moving, if uh, an external viewer is looking at you, uh, he or she doesn't realize if you're moving the hand while applying force or just sliding in contact. Which means that if the interaction is through rigid contact, the difference in position between no application of force or high application of application of high force is uh, indistingu indistinguishable. So, in this sense, you need an extra sensor which allows you to estimate this contact force. This is a very important point. So, really, for there are tasks in which position control cannot do the job. There are other situations, especially when the environment is relatively soft, in which you don't need to control force and you may uh, interact with the environment without uh, having an explicit force control. So, uh, here uh, in a debarring task, for instance, so when you have to remove some extra material from a surface, and now uh, I'm not considering a metallic surface, but I'm considering, for instance, in this picture, the moving of uh, extra uh, plastic uh, material of glue from the border of a windshield of a car, uh, or uh, when the robot is uh, performing another paradigmatic task, which is turning of a crank, uh, for instance, this is... Uh, models the situation when the robot needs to open a door, for instance, in a domestic environment. Uh, this operation is similarly to a phase of turning the crank. Uh, then in this case, is exactly, you have to uh, follow trajectories, otherwise you, uh, for instance, in the second case, you will induce a very high inter internal force, and you may crash, for instance, the handle of a door. Uh, so, uh, accurate execution of trajectory, but together, explicit control of forces. So, exactly the interaction task of our interest. Now, talking about the uh, debarring task, here I have a, a picture taken from a, a master thesis performed many years ago in an ABB Excellence Center in the vicinity of Rome. Unfortunately, this center has closed, so we cannot... Uh, cooperate with them anymore, um, in which it was a, an industrial ABB uh, mounting a, a, an extra tool, uh, a, 
quite heavy tool, you see also with the connection cable, which was a pneumatic tool uh, holding a blade with one degree of freedom and a cell, an load cell measuring the contact force. So the idea was the following. You see on the support plate uh, a car windshield which has been produced, uh, but whose border needs to be refined, so you need to deburr materials from that before the windshield is being assembled in the car body. So uh, this task is executed by letting the robot uh, program in such a way that it follows the nominal geometric path along the uh, surface of the windshield uh, and at the same time uh, apply a force through the pneumatic piston in the uh, tool uh, and reacting to forces by uh, having some compliance at the contact. In fact, this system was a two-blade system. The first blade was controlled uh, under force control, so some force needs to be applied, uh, otherwise this material, which is relatively uh, stiff once it uh, uh, comes at um, uh, ambient temperature. So uh, you need to apply uh, a certain force in order to re remove this extra material. So there was a first plate controlled in force, there's a second plate coming after, uh, just pushed by a passive um, spring, which removes the uh, remaining extra material. It's like the two-blade system, which was made uh, famous by Gillette. So, uh, there are other aspects in this situation, because you can imagine that while following the four sides of this car windshield, first of all, the, the, the windshield has a, a curved surface. So, these are not straight paths, they are curved paths. Second, when uh, you're removing parts uh, below, in the, on, on the side, which is uh, on the downside of the windshield, uh, of course, gravity will act against contact. So, the weight of the tool itself will tend to detach the uh, blade from the surface. So, you have to compensate for gravity. Similarly, when you're going uh, above and you're pushing uh, in the down direction, uh, gravity will help in this. So, regulating force uh, make sure that any uncertainty in gravity compensation is, uh, let's say, taken care of by the force control loop. So we may be uh, a bit farther away from where we should be or closer. In any case, it's the force error that will regulate our position, independently of these external disturbances, including uh, non-perfectly compensated gravity. Okay, so as I mentioned at, uh, at the beginning of this uh, introductory lecture on uh, interaction, uh, robot interaction with the environment, uh, we typically design the control based on how we model the environment. Okay, so uh, the environment model which is more appropriate suggests also the more appropriate uh, control scheme. Now, by and large, apart from simplification and special cases, there are two classes that we will consider, impedance control and hybrid force motion control. So, these controllers are motivated by the way in which we model the environment. So, in the first case, we assume that the environment is a mechanical system, uh, but this mechanical system is not uh, infinitely stiff, so it undergoes small but finite deformation when we push on it. Okay? So when uh, this is the case, if we uh, have a robot in contact with such a uh, compliant element, a compliant environment in a sense, then the forces that will arise will be a balance between two dynamic systems. On one side the environment, on the other side the robot, interact. So, uh, 
forces may be due, uh, large forces may be due because the robot is relatively stiff or the environment undergoes finite deformation, but these are very small, so we are getting toward a fully rigid environment. So depending on the coupled two dynamic system, the forces will arise accordingly. So when uh, impedance control does the following, assign to this interaction not uh, the characteristic of a model to be matched. So not regulating exactly the force, and sometimes not even having a reference for the force, so keeping forces limited, this is the typical case, uh, and not regulating position, because if we assign a position, a desired position which is inside uh, the environment, then we are not guaranteed that we will be able to zero the position error, unless we tolerate uh, very large contact forces, which is not what we are intended to. So there will be a compromise uh, in the choice of the model uh, in the presence of uh, a compliant environment, so a, com a mechanical system that uh, undergoes some form of deformation. On the other hand, hybrid force motion control is most suited if the model of the environment assumes uh, high stiffness or infinite stiffness, which means that the environment is fully rigid. So when the environment is fully rigid and the robot approaches this environment and from one instant on it should keep contact in order to execute this, uh, for instance, mechanically finishing uh, task, then uh, this rigid environment provides a constraint when the robot is in contact. In fact, it's a unilateral constraint because uh, the robot can enter in contact but can always leave the contact, so uh, retracting itself. It, can, it cannot go inside the object. However, as long as we are interested in controlling forces, we should keep contact. So this unilaterality can be considered as a bilateral constraint. So like having the robot being glued on the or the end effect or the tool of the robot being glued on this geometric surface. So you can imagine that uh, the contact forces in this picture result from any attempt to violate the geometric constraint. And in fact, this is a way in which uh, such kind of very relevant situation can be modeled and accordingly you can define the composition in the task space of direction where you satisfy automatically the geometric constraint, so free motion direction, and then you would like to control the way in which you move along this free motion direction, and other direction where you cannot violate constraint, but while attempting to violate, you generate reaction forces from the environment and of course you would like to control these forces. So you see that uh, the picture, the, the two uh, approaches are kind of complementary. There are pros and cons on both situations but essentially are driven by the type of model which is more appropriate to describe the interaction with the environment. Uh, I should uh, mention two additional aspects which are very general at this stage. There has been a long discussion in the, in the, among the robotics researchers uh, uh, about which of these two approaches is better. And this, in my view, makes little sense. Uh, the, the, the group of people that sustain uh, impedance control uh, mention explicitly the fact that in impedance control you don't need an accurate level of knowledge about the geometry of the environment. Instead, in hybrid force motion control, because you're writing down geometric constraints, so you know you need to know exactly this geometry, and this may become uh, a restrictive requirement. But in fact, this difference is only apparent, because if you want to 
if you look at the performance, uh, the performance becomes similar uh, with uh, a similar amount of knowledge about the environment. And we will uh, comment on this while dealing with impedance control or with hybrid force motion control. So this level of knowledge is kind of similar uh, if you would like to achieve uh, good uh, performance in the interaction. Uh, I must say, however, that uh, while in the hybrid force motion control, you need to measure forces because you close the loop around the force error in some direction. So you need to have a measure of force. Now, this measure may be induced by some model-based virtual sensing, but this is a different story. You need a, a measure of, uh, of force. On the other hand, in impedance control, uh, you may need uh, force measurement, but if you uh, release uh, the uh, performance in particular, if you accept to live with the actual inertia of the robot at the contact point, we will be more clear uh, later on on this aspect, then uh, measuring contact forces is not strictly needed. Okay, so this is uh, essentially a uh, a uh, true difference between the two approaches. So, uh, let me conclude by uh, showing a number of examples where the model, the environment itself, uh, lends itself to a, a model which leads to impedance control or to a rigid model which leads to hybrid force motion control. So, first of all, uh, two videos in which uh, impedance control has been realized on one case or hybrid force position control has been realized in the other case. In the first case, um, you can see uh, a mobile manipulator, so a uh, research manipulator mo uh, mounted on a mobile platform, uh, navigating in an indoor office environment and approaching contact with uh, a door, in particular with the handle of a door, and needing to open uh, the door by uh, acting on the hand. So this situation is uh, a typical situation in which impedance control works fine. Why? Because you don't need really to assign a force in the contact, you should need to establish contact and then interact so that you can move the handle in some direction and of course you can apply also forces which result in reaction forces as long as these are limited. And then you progress with the arm and the base, so this is a complete system, in order to open the door. Uh, in the right video is a, a more fancy situation in which um, there's a robot holding a piston and uh, needing to insert the piston into a motor block. Now, to make things more complex, the motor block is not static, but is moving, rotating on a turntable. So, uh, the robot is equipped with a four-star sensor and with a vision camera. So, it recognizes the geometry of the holes. So, this is a pegging hole uh, task. And once uh, it reached the same speed of the rotating uh, turntable, so that the image is fixed in the field of view of the camera mounted on the effector, then, uh, so you have, in a sense, located the position of the one of the, um, uh, of the um, motor holes, uh, then you proceed and get in contact, and when you're in contact, the piston with the motor, uh, you process force information in order to adjust and do the insertion like you have seen in this video. Okay, so uh, as I promised, um, I would like to make some uh, uh, schematic example of the two situations. So the typical situation where you can assume a geometric constraint being imposed to the robot and effector, and this of course will limit the full mobility of the end effector, but on the other hand, will allow the end effector to apply forces to the environment. Is when you have a, a work 
piece, a rigid work piece, with a rigid tool and essentially a rigid uh, full structure of the system. So robot, wrist, uh, an RCC or a, a four-store sensor or in some cases both of them and a tool which is in continuous contact with the workpiece. Then, uh, in this case, we would like to have a stable uh, contact, and this is a not so easy as one can imagine, because there are situations in which, in the attempt of controlling the force along a certain direction, uh, there could be some uh, chattering phenomena, which is a, a way of revealing some instability in the control design. So, we would like to have a stable and accurate uh, following of the geometric surface, and this is because the workpiece is very stiff, and the whole system is very stiff, so we would like also to, desire, to apply the desired contact forces. So this is a typical situation in which uh, a constrained geometric model works at best, and therefore a hybrid force motion control scheme. Well, uh, this is another compliance situation, I would say a rather unusual one. Uh, this picture and uh, the uh, sketch comes from a work that has been performed over uh, decades now in Australia for ship shearing. In fact, as you know, there are nowadays, I think this is still true, more ships than humans, so the activity of uh, ship sharing is one that you would like to automatize in this situation. So the ships are being, uh, uh, this is a prototype that we have done a uh, number of uh, improvements lately, but the idea that I want to convey is the following. So the ship is being held in place and there's a complex multi-degree of freedom arm uh, mounted on a trail, uh, on a linear trail that carries uh, a ship's shearing tool. And of course, the geometry of the, of the, of the ship is uncertain. You could, be, uh, you could have a, a bigger one, a smaller one. Uh, so you have an approximate model to work with, you know, an approximate geometry. So you need to enter in contact. Indeed, if you don't push enough, you will not be able to cut the wood remove the wool from the, from the surface of the ship. Uh, however, if you go too down and you uh, assume that uh, the ship was smaller than expected, so your geometric model is very bad, you may um, even kill the ship. So this is a si typical situation in which you like to keep forces limited, you don't really need to follow a, a trajectory, so you need to interact in a compliant way, so with an impedance model, uh, which is most appropriate for performing the task. So the quality of the results is being able to uh, uh, shear the wool of the sheep. Now, uh, this, as I said, has been uh, improved over the years, and remains a question if the ship is happy with this type of uh, automatic treatment. But this is a different story. And finally, there are indeed also situations where a mixed uh, condition applied. So the interaction may occur at some times with a geometric and rigid environment in some other situation or phases of uh, the task, uh, a compliant a treatment would be better. So for instance, in this case, you can see uh, a phase of assembly in which uh, there is an approach phase, free motion, there's a first contact, and this is uh, a hard contact with the surface, and in this phase, searching for the hole, so we are assuming that we have a large uncertainty uh, in this pegging hole uh, assembly task, uh, so in this searching phase we are in contact but we can assume a geometric surface or a rigid surface until we get close to the uh, hole and the third phase, the insertion phase, 
can be performed either with a RCC, so in a passive way, or in an active way, but assuming some compliance in the structure, in particular in the presence of a, an RCC, which is per se a compliant element. Remember that compliance can be distributed in several places, not only at the contact, there could be compliance also at the joints, if we have uh, elastic joints, and all this type of uh, compliance contribute to the actual uh, interaction. And we will see more uh, as we proceed in the analysis. So, for the time being, we stop here. Uh, the next uh, lecture will be devoted to ways of handling uh, geometric interaction, so situation in which uh, the contact is uh, stiff enough. And we will see this with simple cases first and then detail the general formalism of modeling and control. Thank you for listening for the moment.